different species, including salmon, Pacific hake, and English sole. And um, if you don't come up with a good question today, I recommend asking about his picture on his NOAA profile. Uh, should be good for some conversation later on. So he's going to talk to us today about trace elements and stable isotopes and how you can use them to ID fish performance and movement throughout their lives. So very relevant to Pacific halibut. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this facility is phenomenal. I'm sure you guys hear that whenever you get a speaker coming in. This is gorgeous. Um, and on a nice sunny day, it's really nice to, to see the water. I don't know how... Um, I feel honored that you're in here in a closed room as opposed to sitting by the windows. Um, yeah, so today I'd like to share with you some uh, a couple projects, and if time permits, a third, that revolve around the use of chemical tracers in, in different ways. But generally, through my grad school days to present, I've been really interested in understanding movement and migration. And um, what I'd like to take the opportunity with is... is um, Yeah, let me do this. Is um, thank you. Um, highlighting a project on. Thank you so much. Did you hit enter? Was that the magic? Did you hit enter? Was that? No, I just had to click on the picture. Oh. Okay. So I'd like to start off by giving you a bit of background on chemical tracers, really just a primer, and then I like to dive into um, uh, work on fall chinook salmon. Um, in which we were using otolith chemistry to look at rearing location and then to uh, look at somatic growth. Um, and then I'd like to shift gears to Pacific Hake, uh, a project, an ongoing project that we've been working on, looking at growth in, in Salish Sea and, uh, and shared environments. And then if time permits, uh, this is a new project we just started last summer and it's using um, stable isotopes to assess the extent to which kelp and eelgrass beds are providing uh, a nutritional contribution to a variety of species in Puget Sound, with the focus being on rockfish. So with, um, with that being said, a bit of uh, this kind of background. So, you know, understanding the uh, extent to which or the location of fish and or the extent to which they're moving is obviously really important. Um, and knowing where fish are, what habitats they're utilizing, and also the time at which they utilize these different habitats is really important for management um, uh, plans and planning. Um, and knowing where fish are is a way that we can, for example, minimize things like bycatch, it is a way to help identify essential fish habitats. Now, there's a variety of tools that one can utilize to assess movement, and they're generally categorized in these, these two uh, groupings, an artificial tag or a natural tag. Um, and I just want to take a few slides that just kind of walk through these different groupings, because I think it's really important um, to understand how these different tags have different utilities. They operate at different scales, spatial or temporal scales. And so to get the most bang for your buck when running a project, it's good to have that in mind. Um, and so here we have our two groupings, artificial and natural tags. Your artificial tags are things we're all common, we're all we're, we're very familiar with, things like floy tags and anchor tags. Um, uh, those are external tags, but you have a, a variety of internal artificial tags. Artificial tags, I should have stipulated at the beginning, are, are ones in which the researcher is physically tagging uh, an organism. And things like alizarin, uh, oxytetracycline, these are compounds that are taken up into the tissues of a fish um, and particularly laid down on the growing otolith to give you a visible, visible uh, mark 
Um, isotopes have been, cocktails of barium have been used um, to assess larval dispersal in coral reef fishes. Um, females have been injected with a cocktail of different ratio, ratios of barium isotope, and they have been, the eggs have then subsequently been marked to, um, to then read those larvae been recaptured at a later date to assess the extent to which those larvae were dispersed. So that's kind of your artificial grouping in general. Your natural tags are those in which the environment is doing the tagging. Um, things like gene frequencies that are going to vary over the course of obviously generations. That's a, an example of a, a natural tag. But then there's, there's things like trace elements and stable isotopes that um, are the result of the environment the fish is occupying, the prey that the, the fish or mammal is eating, all of which are taken up into the tissues and can tell you something about where they have been. Um, now, important with these tags are, like I said, they, they operate at different scales, or they can they have utility at, uh, to be used at different biological and slash spatial scales. So just a, this is just a representation here of kind of how I envision these tags to be broken down. Um, the biggest oval is species, the smaller circles within that are populations within that species, and then the smallest circle are your individuals. And um, with external tags, they're uh, labor intensive, they can be costly. Um, you have the um, issue of needing to tag them, needing to collect them, needing to tag them, and then release them, and at some later date, recollect them. And so there's, a, there's several steps involved. And your the kind of scale that you're off, often, most studies are operating, is within a population. You only have so many tags, you only have so much time to tag uh, a certain number of, of individuals. Contrast that to something like a natural tag, where you have uh, the environment is doing the tagging. Um, you have the cap potential that populations are uh, uniquely tagged, or at least to a certain extent. Now, the caveat with the natural tags, of course, is you're, at, you're handcuffed to the natural variability of those isotopes in the environment. And so the limitation there is that if you're interested in looking at the movement of, say, English soul in Elliott Bay, and you're focused solely on using a natural tag, the trace elements within Elliott Bay are not going to be spatially variable enough for you to answer that question. And so having to pick the right tag that's appropriate for your question is, is critical and honestly it can be difficult. Um, so this is kind of like the biological scale slash uh, spatial scale. And then you have this kind of temporal scale of investigation. Now, for things like your external tags, typically when you are when you have individuals tagged, you might be looking at recapturing them weeks to months, uh, maybe at most years later. Um, of course, the with mortality, natural or predation, you're going to be losing those tags through time, and so the amount of information you can obtain um, is going to be diminishing as, as you move along. Generally speaking, these kind of external tags, um, you're going to be looking at kind of weeks to years worth of uh, investigations. Now with the natural tags, depending on the tissue that you're focusing on, say you're interested in looking at trace elements in otoliths, or say you're looking at stable isotopes in tissues, each of those has a different turnover rate. Otoliths do not have a turnover rate. They are inert and they're phenomenal in that you have this large chronological record. But things like muscle um, have an order of you know, one to two months worth of information that has um, been a um, result of the consumer eating whatever prey it is. Um, blood is another tissue, another type of material that is used to look at a much smaller window of time. So we're talking about days worth of information of what the consumer ate. Um, 
heart muscle has been used, um, liver, uh, all these different tissues kind of vary in their turnover rates and give you different kind of portions of the life of an individual that you can investigate. Um, now, of course, when you're talking about gene frequencies, you can be talking about generations. So we're kind of, we have this large potential for different uh, kinds of questions you can ask. So the one thing that I want to include from that is this third category, and for lack of a better term, I've labeled this hybrid. Um, and this is kind of a marriage between the natural and artificial. These are, and I, f I feel that this is really a, an exciting new, not new, but in, uh, I'm excited about the potential of incorporating these tags with our external and internal tags. And what I mean by artificial, these are tags that are man-made, but they are not purposefully introduced into the organisms. These are tags that are created through industry, agriculture, um, through you know, development, through um, pollution, oil spills, for example, um, and they're released into the environment either acutely or chronically, and they can tag individuals and be utilized as a tracer. Fukushima Daiichi, the, the Japanese, the, the reactor that, that collapsed uh, several years ago was a horrendous incident, but it provided researchers a really amazing um, tool to look at the dispersal of uh, phytoplankton uh, up to fish in and around that region. Um, and that's just one example. And so oil spills like the Deepwater Horizon, um, those compounds that are in the oil are taken up into the tissues at various levels and can be quantified to give you a sense for the extent to which tuna or other fishes or mammals had moved in through the area. Um, and so I just wanna take a few slides to kind of focus on this hybrid approach. And it was this, this paper um, recently published by members at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. And they were interested in killer whales up in the uh, Alaskan region. Um, and they were interested in understanding movement um, of these uh, populations. I'm gonna call them populations. I don't know if that's the right term or not, but I'm gonna call them populations. Um, and they were using stable isotopes from tissue samples from um, killer whales, as well as persistent organic uh, pollutants, things like DDTs, PCBs, PBDEs, or flame retardants are, are um, ever present in our waterways. Um, and so they had, there are these two groups of killer whales, resident killer whales that are typically found in the central and eastern Aleutians and then in the Gulf of Alaska. And, and they're typically fish eaters. Um, the uh, transient killer whales are more mammal eaters um, and they're primarily uh, found in this eastern Aleutians. And what um, Cron et al. wanted to do is, is first look at the stable isotopes. Now, here's a, this is a, uh, Pethy Bridge recently published this review um, on chemical tracers and, and this was a useful figure that I snatched. Um, so stable isotopes, um, you have this axis, the y-axis is nitrogen, the x-axis is uh, carbon. And think of carbon, the carbon changes very little as you're moving through the food web as phytoplankton gets consumed by a fish and then a bigger fish eats that fish. Carbon doesn't change a whole lot. And carbon has the utility of telling you the habitats that these organisms pass through um, at a very broad scale in the sense of you get an indication of a benthic um, kind of a sourced food web versus a pelagic sourced food web. And it can tell you a little bit finer grain than that, but for our purposes, we're just gonna kind of focus on that. The nitrogen axis, on the other hand, does change. It, it uh, becomes enriched with each successive trophic level. And so this, is, has utility and it does so in a predictive manner. So it has utility that you can use this information to um, determine the trophic level that that particular organism is feeding in. I'm particularly fascinated with, with nitrogen at the moment is as 
uh, with with regards to how shifting climate patterns may or may not be changing the um, the food availability for different organisms and how you can detect that with you know a time series if you have several archived tissue samples that you can look at to see how what you what they have been feeding in the past and then relate that to say El Nino years versus La Nina years to get a sense for how their diet foraging has has changed. Anyways, back to the plot. Um, so Cronodel had these samples from killer whales and what they found is that there was this spatial variability from central to eastern Aleutian to the resident Gulf of Alaska. Um, and they all kind of varied on this carbon axis. The residents of Gulf of Alaska had a slightly higher nitrogen indicating that they were eating, feeding on critters that were a little higher in the trophic level. Um, the other kind of takeaways, transients, as was expected, they're higher up on the nitrogen scale. They're eating, they're predicted to be always eating primarily mammals. And so you would expect them to have a higher nitrogen because it's a higher trophic level they're feeding on. So this was really informative because what you saw is that your the, the, the population groupings were um, indicating that the foraging is relatively localized. They are staying and they're differentiate. They're able to be differentiated based on the carbon and nitrogen within their tissues. Um, and so the, the next thing that they were interested in is how can they, how does this information relate to information in the contaminant analyses of their tissues? And so here on this plot on the x-axis, is a particular DDT, I don't remember what it's called, ratio to all the DDTs that were measured in the uh, tissue. But this DDT, it's, a, it's an indicator of a, of a pesticide. It's, in particular, it's one that's in use in Asia. And on the y-axis, at the top here, we just have killer whales. And the thing that I wanna draw your attention to is the, where the red arrows are. And that's where this uh, group of killer whales are offshore and another group that's the transients. These are ones that are known to move down and back and forth from California. They had the lowest levels of this particular contaminant, this pesticide. While the Gulf of Alaska residents had these higher and more elevated levels of this. And in fact, there was this gradient or pattern of from west to, to east. Um, as you move from the central Aleutians to the east and Lucians to the Gulf of Alaska, you had lower and lower. And that was supporting the, the notion that these pesticides are being transported via currents across the Aleutians and a lower, lower uh, as the gradient kind of dissipated towards you went into the Gulf. Um, now they went and they collected prey um, and the prey further supported that information. What they saw in Chinook salmon with the red arrows again, and in California sea lion, that this pesticide is in low levels there, which is uh, as to be expected given it's banned in the use in North America. Um, but yet the uh, levels of this particular pesticide were high in a variety of critters that are eaten by killer whales in Alaska. And so we see that this pattern of, um, of contaminants in the tissues was reflecting what they're eating and that those food sources did in fact have these higher levels. So I just wanted to bring this um, up as a, this I feel is where we're gonna be going more and more to is, is kind of usurping different tags to if, if trace elements and OLIS can't get at your question, then stable isotopes and trace elements and POPs and so on in genetics can help uh, together as a, as a portfolio uh, approach, uh, get at your question. Um, okay, so with that, I'd like to share with you some work um, that's recently, it's in press um, and looking at fall Chinook salmon. And we had three objectives during this project. And one was to identify where adults uh, reared as juveniles, to uh, estimate which out migration strategy they exhibited. I'll describe this in a second. And then um, relate that out migration strategy to how fast or slow individuals grew. So a bit of background. Um, 
Snake River. Um, in the 1960s, the Hell's Canyon Dam was created, uh, thereby impounding, uh, restricting the movement of fall Chinook salmon to around 90% of their historic spawning ground. Um, as a result, numbers of uh, returning adults plummeted. Um, in 92, the species was listed um, as threatened. And since then, there have been, um, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of recovery in the populations. And there's a variety of factors that have been contributing to this, everything from harvest uh, levels, to hatchery practices, to um, juveniles have to move out across eight dams to get to the ocean. And those adults that survive have to move back through those eight dams to find spawning ground. So that is, um, that can really impact survival. Um, reduced availability, connectivity of freshwater habitats, um, temperature changes as a result of that impoundment of uh, creation of various dams. And so we were uh, focused on, you have finite resources, of course, and you want to be able to prioritize which habitats are the most important for population recovery. And so we set out to identify locations in the Snake River Basin that were uh, critical to rearing, ha rearing habitats. Um, so think of it as, as like essential fish habitat, but this is salmon speak, so you got to say rearing location. Um, and so, Fortunately, um, collaborators at the University of Idaho, um, Jens Hegg in particular, was a grad student at the time, um, went out and collected uh, water samples throughout the Snake River Basin. Um, and uh, in, uh, he published a paper uh, in which we show the, the results of the strontium ratio uh, from these water samples. And in this uh, paper, there was distinct strontium isotopic differences between several groups of rivers. The Imnaha, Grand Ron, and Tucannon were unique isotopically in terms of strontium with the Snake River and with the Clearwater and Salmon Rivers. And the, the, the reason for this is the, the strontium varies with, um, with a different underlying bedrock in the river systems. And so, these um, rivers have um, were formed by various tectonic processes, and the underlying bedrock has different levels of the strontium ratios, and that seeps up, dissolves into the water, and you have these kind of different signatures. Um, and so this afforded us this really unique opportunity um, in which you had a unique chemical signature at a spatial scale that you're actually interested in, um, and the other piece of information was how do you relate that to the fish? And again, fortunately, Brian Kennedy, also at the University of, of Idaho, in early, late 1990s published a, a paper that showed a direct relationship between strontium ratio in the water and that of its otolith. And so here we had this this fingerprint that we could use to link a fish to rearing habitat. So when we, in 2011, we had collected a bunch of adult fall Chinook salmon that had returned to spawn um, in the Snake River Basin. We yanked their otoliths, we polished them and, and took images for microstructural analysis, for age and growth analysis. Um, and then we focused on uh, the microchemistry of the juvenile portion of their, their life um, and related that information, that chemical information to the water chemistry. We use the maximum likelihood approach. I think it's mixed tools. It was an R package. It is an R package. Um, and we came up with, we assigned each of our 124 adults to one of these three sites um, they had to have a, a probability, a classification that was twice as greater than, than just random chance. So we, we left the fourth category of an unknown chemical signature in the event that we, uh, we, couldn't high, uh, we couldn't classify an individual with a great level of confidence. So, oops. so the, the results from that analysis are wild fish. We identified that 
49% of them had reared in the uh, Clearwater and, Snake, and Salmon River, and 43% of them from the uh, Snake River, 3% from the Toucan and Grand Ronde and Imha. So, so this is great. These are estimates. We constructed estimates from adult fish. Great. We then wonder, okay, well, how, and as anyone would ask, how legit is this? Um, and so we found, you know, through looking at um, uh, red abundance of reds and spawning abundances within each of these river reaches, that those proportions align with what we'd expect given the number of fish that come back to each of those river groups to spawn. The f further kind of um, validation of, or confidence, I guess gives conf confidence in these results, was that we also had 21 juveniles for which they were collected in the Snake River Basin. They were tagged with a coated wire tag, I think. Um, they were released and recollected uh, towards the lower portion of the Snake River. So these 21 individuals, we knew they had a rearing location of the Snake River. And when we ran those individuals through our maximum likelihood approach again, 82% uh, of them um, were correctly classified to the Snake River. Two individuals were classified to the Imnaha, uh, Grand Ronde, Toucanon rivers, um, and one was the Clearwater and one I think was unassigned. Um, and we, um, we speculate that the individuals that were misclassified potentially were spending time at the confluence of the snake in these other rivers, and thus the water chemistry that was being taken up into the fish and into the otolith was reflecting these um, off-channel uh, locations. So we had an idea of where our adults were spending time um, when they were juveniles. Re another important um, piece of information to understand is which, uh, when, they, when do they migrate out to sea? Now, during the time of listing, um, 1992, the dominant out-migration strategy for fall Chinook salmon was the sub-yearling strategy. And basically this is the um, once fish hatch that they sh move out to the sea shortly after they, uh, they hatch. So it's, it's a pretty narrow window few months within that hatching, they're out to sea or moving out to sea. In, and so as a result, so during this period of listing, this sub strategy was a dominant strategy. As a result, the management plans that were uh, created and are still in place revolve around the sub strategy, the, the assumption that um, to get fish safely down to the ocean, it's the bulk of them are going to be the sub strategy and you've got to alter flows during that kind of summer fall period of their lives. Just fast forward a few years, decades, um, early 2000s, Billy Connor and a bunch of others started to detect this large, these larger fish coming out of the Snake River and into the estuary, Columbia River estuary. And they pieced together these were fish that had held over in fresh water. They didn't migrate right out to sea shortly after they, uh, they hatched. Instead, they call, it's called overwintering. They, they hung out in fresh water for several months over the winter and then initiated their out river migration the following spring. And so these, this group was referred to as yearlings. So, um, our, so our task was to, of our collected adults, to evaluate which of these life history strategies um, are exhibited. Now these are, again, I should point out, these are bookends. You know, the, we're making these two categories and we're for, forcing fish into them. There are likely some gradient of, of, there's a distribution of which organisms can be clustered around these two points, but um, for the sake of argument, we categorized fish as either sub yearlings or yearlings. And how we did that was we turned to the otolith chemistry again. Um, here we have our adult otolith and the red is indicating a, a trace scan, a laser scan across the surface to get um, strontium ratio from um, all 
aspects of the otolith. And the, uh, from the core, which is a uh, period in time around when the fish hatched, out to the edge around the time when the fish died. Um, and on the x-axis, we have that otolith radius. On the, on the y-axis, we have the strontium ratio. The black line is that ratio. <clears throat> the, the blue dashed line is the strontium ratio of ocean water. It's stable, it's, it's known um, quantity. The arrow indicates the point at which the strontium isotope of the fish's otolith converges onto that ocean signal. And so that's the point on the fish's otolith where the fish entered the ocean. Um, and so we mark that and for this particular fish, it's 950 microns. And we then wanted to determine what's the otolith radius at the formation of the first annulus on the otolith. Um, and so the first annulus is generally formed around the, the first winter, you know, March, April, February, March, April. Um, and it's this visible portion on the otolith. The radius out to that mark was measured for all of our fish and um, identified on these, on these axes. Now, Billy Connor came up with a simple equation of I quantify or categorizing fish as either yearlings or subyearlings. And basically, if the, old, if the first annulus mark is before they hit the ocean, then that um, fish is a yearling. And if that annulus mark is after, you know, that fish moved out, hit the ocean before the its annual mark was formed. So it's a sub -yearling. So when we did this for all of our fish, we observed that, um, we estimated that 79% of our adults were this yearling strategy. Now, again, remember in, when at the listing, it was assumed that the sub yearlings were the dominant strategy. In, 2005, in that paper by Billy Connor and others, um, they estimated the uh, yearling contribution was something like 45%. Jens Hegg's paper five years ago uh, estimated 65%. So the, there's a slow march of increasing the a proportion of yearlings that are represented in this population. And that has really important management ramifications because right now all management with regards to dam operations is geared towards the assumption that the sub yearlings are the ones that are coming through. So, um, so we had this information. The last bit that I wanna talk about with Fall Chinook has to do with size. From these otoliths, we knew the part of the otolith where they entered the ocean. So that gives an otolith radius. We have information on size, um, fish size versus otolith radius. So we could use, uh, I think we use like a Fraser-Lee equation to estimate fork length at an earlier point in their uh, lives. And we were interested in determining how much overlap in fish size there was with these two migration strategies. Now, I assumed going in that your yearlings are spending more time in fresh water. So they're gonna be older by the time they hit the ocean and they're going to be much bigger. And I was envisioning a body by modal distribution. I was envisioning your sub yearlings are gonna be on the left side, smaller fish. Your yearlings have spent a lot more time in fresh water, a lot more opportunity to grow before they hit the ocean. They're gonna be much bigger. And I was really surprised to see that there was some overlap, not a lot, but you know, 35% of our yearlings overlapped in size. Um, and so this suggested a couple things. Uh, one main thing, and that is that, that spending more time in fresh water had always been assumed to be really advantageous to your uh, survival and your, your growth. Growth, the bigger you are, the higher chances of survival. Um, but spent for these yearlings that we were looking at, they're spending more time in the fresh water, but some of them weren't attaining a much larger uh, body size. And so there, there wasn't this necessary big advantage in our eyes for this small sliver of the, of the group that they were seeing a size advantage for, for remaining in, in fresh water. Now, the caveat um, that I put up there to remind me myself um, is that we're focusing on adults that had survived downstream migration as juveniles and that returned. And so 
if there's any sort of selective pressure on faster or slower growers, we're unable to detect that. We're dealing with only the ones that succeeded. Um, so we've got to kind of keep that in mind when we're um, when I'm uh, bloviating about whether or not yearlings or subyearlings are the better strategy. So um, just tying up this, you know, using the otolith chemistry, we're really fortunate that we had a study organism and a study system that had a chemical tracer that was unique at a spatial scale that we were interested in finding a, a various answers to. Um, now, what I'd like to change gears to is this ongoing project looking at Pacific Hake. And this is Hake in the Salish Sea. Um, now, there are several questions that I want to get at, but let me just kind of dive in. So a bit of a background. In Puget Sound, there, there in Salish Sea, there are two populations, a Georgia Strait population and a Puget Sound population. The Puget Sound population um, has seen dramatic declines in uh, abundances and biomass for several decades. In 1990, the fishery, small fishery, but a fishery in Puget Sound was closed and has been closed since. Um, and for several decades now, this, despite this closure, the population in Puget Sound has not recovered. Um, and in fact, it continues to decline in, in various metrics. And this is in contrast to the Georgia Strait population that remains relatively stable. Um, and definitely the coastal population, which I won't talk about, sorry, but um, it's definitely relatively stable. Now, size differences between these populations have been reported. Um, the Georgia Strait Hake grow to be larger than that in the Puget Sound. And it's been attributed to the intense fishery, taking out the large, slower growing fish. Um, and, but we were interested in kind of diving down and teasing that information out and, or that question about size and when do those size differences arise between the two populations. Um, now, fortunately, colleagues, Chris Grandin up at DFO um, and in WDFW, Wayne Paulson and Dave Lowry, um, they had archived odalis that for Georgia Strait, they dated back to having fish that had hatch years in the 70s um, and, and 90s and imputed sound, you can see basically from the 80s to present. And I keep on adding in a year, um, I've got to learn to cut the umbilical and just, and just get this paper out. Um, but so we used these collection of odalis and we focused on uh, determining growth um, using, uh, focusing on seasonal growth. So um, you have these annual banding patterns. So we looked at each of our odalis and determined how much odalith radius was deposited in the first summer, in the first winter, in the second summer, in the second winter. And from that, we uh, started to build up um, estimates of, um, estim estimating from that information, total length. We also collected odalith trace element data from each of our odalis, the usual suspects of, of manganese, magnesium, barium, lead, and, and strontium. Now, let me just start with this. So this plot on the, on the y-axis, we have total length. On the x-axis, we have, uh, these are reconstructed first summer, first winter, uh, year seasons. Um, so we're looking at each of our odalis and estimating how big they were at the end of their first summer, at the end of their first winter, so on and so forth. And um, Georgia Strait is in blue, Puget Sound is in red. And we see that kind of in that first summer and first winter, the two populations have on average about the same amount of, uh, same total length, around 100 millimeters. But in that second summer um, and third summer, you, you see to see that kind of deviation occurring between the two populations. And when we take this information and just um, look at it in terms of the growth, the amount of growth they laid in terms of length in the first summer, you see that, you know, Georgia Strait and Puget Sound fish were growing at about 100 millimeters in that first summer. Um, by the second summer, you see the, the Puget Sound fish are growing about 75 millimeters compared to 125. And then it really drops off for Puget Sound in the third summer. 
So the caveat of these is I'm pulling hatch years here and I'm also have repeated measurements. You know, there are multiple years that are, uh, have data points from a single fish, multiple year seasons that are from a single fish. Um, but what this is highlighting is that that second and third summer were really critical um, in terms of, you see that size difference occurring between the two populations. Now, we had, um, uh, what we wanted to then do is break it down in terms of um, hatch year decade. And so what I just want to walk you through is, is mean growth um, for each of these years and seasons. And for the 1970s and the 90s in Georgia Strait, there's very little change in their growth from summer to summer, from winter to winter. It's the, the 1990s, fish that were hatched in 1990s show a little elevation in mean growth in the first summer and, uh, and a decrease in the, in the third summer. Now let's compare that to the Puget Sound data. We had four decades of hatch years, relative, uh, roughly, that were represented. In the 1980s, first summer, fish are growing about 75 millimeters on average. It's a little lower than what we see in Georgia Strait. Their second summer is on par with what we see in Georgia Strait. Third summer, they're growing substantially less than, uh, than Georgia Strait. And as we march through time, we see that the first summer, Georgia Puget Sound fish are actually growing a little bit more in that first summer. Um, and in that third summer in particular, we see a substantial, or sorry, the second summer in particular, 20, the fish that hatched in 2010 and, and, uh, and to, to present had a substantial drop in the amount of growth they, they uh, exhibited. Um, the first summer, the increase in growth in Puget Sound in that first summer, um, we don't know for sure, but we are thinking that there might be an, a shift in hatch dates. So they're, they're actually having an earlier hatch date and having a lot more potential of growing. Um, you know, the other alternative is that there's just a lot more food to, to be had and they're just doing a lot better uh, growth in that kind of environment. And we're not so sure on the, on the, the environment is so healthy and happy for them. We're more on the X side of that their uh, hatch dates are maybe a little earlier. Um, and so, okay, great. Second and third summers appear to be a really critical time in why we see these size differences between populations. We now wanted to try to uh, tease out any sort of factors that are contributing to the variability we see within the second summer or within the third summer. And so we um, performed some, some uh, ran some models on our second growth of, of, of data. Um, we had explanatory variables that represented just kind of climatic shifts uh, or just climate in general. Um, <clears throat> and these of course would be applied to both Puget Sound and, and Georgia Strait populations. But then we had some kind of more localized variables, um, orca abundance, harbor seal abundance. And then we had the trace element data, which, um, for several of them kind of represent our recordings of the environment the fish are occupying. So the exception being magnesium. Magnesium has been used as a metabolic indicator, um, but manganese, Karen Lindbergh on the East Coast, uh, she's done some really phenomenal work in the Baltic Sea using manganese and otoliths as an indicator of hypoxia. Um, Strontium has been used as an indicator of salinity and uh, temperature. Barium, higher levels of barium are found in upwelling areas. And so you'll get uh, a barium spike if they're in around, you know, uh, 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 current flow that's bringing cooler nutrient rich water up. Um, lead, I kept lead in the analysis because I was hopeful that we could pick up some sort of um, to toxicological uh, impact, fuel, is a contributor of lead in uh, the environment. It's a, in one case, it's uh, lead is in a fuel additive for aviation. Um, <clears throat> I'll, just, I'll cut to the chase, lead wasn't helpful at all. Um, but we ran these models and we ran every combination of those 12 variables and for Georgia Strait, the, the looking at variability in the second summer uh, for fish uh, hatched in Georgia Strait, 
and we did a separate analysis for Puget Sound. Um, as you can see, the relationships are pretty weak. Um, we see the most important variables for Georgia Strait are manganese and um, strontium. Um, Turner and Lindbergh recently put a paper that they too saw um, an increase in manganese levels um, positively associated with daily growth in I forget what species it was Manhattan I don't I don't I don't remember um, and and as I just mentioned to you manganese is a, a indicator of um, Lindbergh, the second author on this paper, is that it, manganese is an uh, indicator of hypoxia. And so I thought on this, um, and I'd love any alternatives, is um, hypoxia events are usually preceded by nutrient loading, a lot of nutrients being dumped into the system. And if, um, if what we possibly are, are recording here is instances in which that nutrient loading is in the system. They're being taken up into the fish and that's also providing a wealth of prey species that the fish are um, able to get a little bit of bump in growth. It's a weak relationship, but I mean, that's, that's where I'm thinking of it at the moment. Um, strontium salt water versus fresh uh, brackish water, we, we see that relationship. We also see those two variables played out in Puget Sound. Um, hake, along with slight negative relationships with harbor seal and orca abundance, which I thought was interesting. Um, as you have more and more predator around, you have you have less growth. Um, so you're spending more time staying away or hiding um, compared to feeding. Again, weak relationships. Um, the last thing I want to get to, I, I see that I am overly verbose, um, is shared environments. And so we had this unique opportunity again it, because we had the otolith chemistry for all these fish and we had cohorts of fish that we could dive a little bit into. And in, for example, fish that hatched in 1994, we had fish collected in Puget Sound and Georgia Strait and we had fish that were the same age. And this was kind of repeated for 90 fish that were the same age, hatched in 1985, two-year-olds, I think. And we had five-year-olds collected in 2002 that had hatched in 97. So we wanted to look at, I've been really interested, up until this point, I've been focusing on portions of the otolith and uh, giving in, seeing how that relates to growth or to reconstructing juvenile portions of life. And, I'm really interested in looking at these trace elements as a time series and start to um, investigate how they are recording the life uh, of the environments that they're visiting. And so for each of these elements, we have several individuals that have these kind of individual time series of barium and manganese and so on. And what I, what we have been doing, and this is recent um, work, really recent, is looking using a dynamic factor analysis to look at here, I'm just showing you barium. Um, and these barium from two-year-old fish, they hatched in 1994. There's 40 of these fish from Puget Sound and Georgia Strait combined, and seeing if there are common trends in their barium profiles, these trace, these sig chemical signatures across their entire otolith. Um, and on the right is fish that hatched in 1995. And we see some, some similarities in trends one and three, both of which kind of show this, this is a, a Z-scored barium, but what we see is um, a spike. If we don't look at the values, we see a general spike of barium around midpoint in their, their life trajectory. Um, trend three is also relatively similar. And when we looked at the factor loadings of each of these trends um, with respect to each of the fish, we did start to see some kind of patterning, um, and I mean slight patterning. Um, and so in general, what we saw is that Georgia Strait fish were associated with trend one and trend three for fish from both hatch years, while Puget Sound fish were associated most are with trend three, which is having this barium spike earlier on in their life, possibly an upwelling in the region. Um, 
to which they're occupying. So, so this we're we're kind of on the road now to this is just barium and repeating this for all of our different elements um, to try to integrate more of a kind of holistic perspective of the environments that fish are occupying throughout their lives and you know the extent to which fish are using um, shared parcels of water basically. Um, so that's where we're headed. If anyone has any um, ideas of how to include multiple, basically multiple time series within a time series analysis from many individuals, or across many individuals, that would be helpful. Because um, right now we're only able to look at this within an element at a time. Um, so um, that was the summary of the, of the, of the Hake. There's this ongoing project we have, and it is literally just kind of, we're getting data um, the last few weeks. Um, and I'm given the time, I'm more than happy to um, talk about this later and any questions you might have, or if anyone's going to lunch, um, as opposed to taking your precious time. So um, I'm gonna just kind of skip ahead um, into the acknowledgements. And um, obviously many people have been involved with these projects. They involve many hands, many brains, um, and I'm just the spokesperson for the moment. So um, thanks for your time. All right, we have any questions? Hi there. Hi. Uh, great talk, by the way. Thank so you. I have lots of questions, but I will stick to, I think, three of them. Okay. <laughs> and a couple of them are probably just, uh, they're just, I don't know a lot about this, um, this subject. So uh, in the, you, uh, early on in your talk, you were talking about um, orcas and the, I can't remember what you were looking at, but oh, the carbon and the nitrogen, yep, yep, is that right? Yep, right. yep. And, um, and so you were able to part those out into different populations, depending on what those are. Does that tell you, do those uh, combinations tell you anything about the actual nutrition that the animals are getting? Because I would expect that the nutritional uh, requirements for the animals would be the same across the board. Right, yeah, I would assume that as well. Um, carbon and nitrogen, will not tell you anything per se about the kind of nutritional value of items that they're receiving. Um, how, so, so no. So the short answer to the question is no. Carbonation will not tell you. They'll give you insight as to um, like a, the trophic position and the kind of source of the primary producers. You know, if as you're moving on to in the Gulf of Alaska, for example, more on the continental shelf, there's going to be more benthic origin of, of carbon. Mm -hmm. um, now, there, there are ways outside, so I'm thinking of, there's a lot of um, analyses that our group does looking at lipids, and that is primarily what they use to kind of look at how healthy. So, you know, that would be using the isotopes to kind of, okay, you you're clearly are eating slightly different things or things that are originating in different locations. Um, and then you, I would, you know, introducing a, a lipid analysis of whatever tissues it is um, to get a sense for, okay, how is the nutritional value? How is the amount of blubber on you going to differ among those and try to then reconstruct, okay, they've, they've shifted in diet uh, <clears throat> and uh, in the nutritional value. Okay. Um, and, but I will though, so I was mentioning this to Joseph earlier, there's a new branch of the carbon and nitrogen analyses that has um, kind of just been in the making the last 10 years or so, and that's fatty acid um, analysis and, and amino acid, compound specific it's called. And this has the ability to dive a little bit deeper. I don't think it'll get to your ultimate question of nutritional value, but can do a lot more of giving you specificity. Generally in those carbonation plots, it's like a cluster plot, right? And so, and it's a bivariate um, with the this advent of amino acid and fatty acid analysis, it can become more of like a multivariate analysis. And so you have the potential to look further into um, 
how carbon is being transferred up through the food web, how nitrogen through various amino acids and fatty acids. So it's really um, a developing technique that can help us answer some of these uh, additional questions. But yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, so in your, um, thank you by the way, yeah. um, in your salmon, uh, you were, now I might have missed this, when you were looking at, I think, strontium levels right. and uh, looking at them going into, leaving the fresh water going into the ocean. Yep. Um, so those were recovered adults when they came back into the rivers, right? right? Correct. So I was curious why that doesn't show up on the otolith. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so what um, the amount of time, so there are two things. I think what's really happening is your otolith growth, uh, the amount of somatic growth has slowed at that point in their you know they're not feed, they're barely feeding they are trucking as they're barely as they're making their way into fresh water and so the amount of material that's deposited on the otolith edge at that point is minimal it's there and they're picking up a freshwater signal but the size of our spot of our laser as it's moving from the you know towards the edge that where that freshwater signal would be is just being swamped by you know the last month in the ocean and so the 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 it's a it's a detection limit it's it's that signal is there but it's just the the when it's coming off the mass spec it's just getting swamped by the marine signal yeah that's a really good question okay uh one more so uh in the the last part of your talk you were talking about hypoxia and that uh relationship of which you didn't find a big relationship yeah, there right um, so I was curious, I think it was um, Baltic Cod. Um, I heard a talk a year or two ago where they were talking about how hypoxia had actually uh, clouded the otoliths, making it impossible for them to age um, wow. to age them okay. the regular way, the way that they were doing. Yep. And so they had to come up with other ways of doing this. I was curious, I, I actually don't know what a, uh, how old a, uh, a uh, hake is when you when you um, catch it or whatever, but is it possible that you're misreading the ages, and so the the relationship would actually be different? Right, a good question. Um, so that the that project um, where I first read that Karen Limberg paper, which highlighted that the uh, manganese levels relationship to hypoxia. I was like, and I knew that Port Susan does suffer from hypoxic events. I was like, this is this is going to be this great test. We're going to try it on Puget Sound, Pacific Hake. All these adults are collected in spawning aggregations in Port Susan. Um, and what we found was that the manganese levels for that, you know, so we focused on the edge. We knew that the fish were, we knew where the fish were collected. They were collected in Port Susan. We focused on the edge. And in years that we had evidence of a hypoxic event, and we just didn't see a relationship. And the manganese levels were maybe the orders of magnitude lower than what they were experiencing Baltic. So that leads me to think that the effect of a clouding of an otolith would be minimal in our otolith, given that the kind of large hypoxic events that Port Susan has experienced have not been that um, significant that number the, there haven't been very many and they haven't been that big the ones that we have had so that gives me confidence that that um, it's possible but it gives me confidence that that's not a prevalent thing in their aged otoliths yeah yeah great talk um, I haven't had any questions online but I do have two questions one is to the question about when you're doing the laser work on the to get those chemical signatures is there a layer on the outside i mean you draw the otolith as just a series of rings but i'm assuming that the otolith is also uh having a bit of growth on the upper surface so are you burning down to a certain depth we're, and then doing your reading yeah yeah we're polishing each of our otoliths so that we're the core is exposed and okay. so we're we're um, ablating material from uh, the stat core exposed surface. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the second question, you had the the comment that you had your, I forget what you call them, your yearlings or whatever that were staying over the overwintering yeah. animals, and that there could be some influence there that you're you're looking only at returning fish that have been successful out at sea. 
Um, it, it's not necessarily though that you're just looking at a fast growing or a slow growing animal. It could also be that the timing is creating a pressure where there's less predators when they head out to sea and you're seeing a higher success rate of those animals coming back and, and putting animals back into the system. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Really good point. Yes. Um, uh, the, the, this, this whole, the advent of this yearling life history strategy has thrown a, a lot of confusion into an already confusing system and and you hit on it really well with yes there's that the 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 notion has always been that <clears throat> the sub yearling strategy had evolved to match resources that are available you know when they hit the estuary and, and into the ocean um but it, you know my assumption is that given the speed bumps that are the dams and other factors involved that they have had to evolve an alternative and or they're they're as i as i uh, said earlier is that their hatch dates are being pushed so far back that their um the time at which they have to grow and then move downstream is is narrowed and so they just end up staying but Circling back to what you said, yes, I mean, it, you're, you're right. It could be that um, when they do make it to the ocean, they are benefiting greatly by whatever um, resources available to them, uh, regardless of being sub yearling or yearling, but maybe the subs are, or some of the yearlings are um, notably benefiting from that. Yeah. Yeah, nice talk, Paul. Um, I just had a question um, regarding the potential use of barium as an indicator of upwelling. Mm -hmm. uh, and has it been used to um, derive information from offshore, onshore movements in, in marine species? Yes, yeah, it, it has um, to a certain degree. Um, the The always the issue with trace elements uh all the issue will always be that um you know it, well i mean it's kind of like your your stock assessments your agent you always have to have another year of data to kind of um add that information of say age structure or information that will update what your assessment is for something like barium or any other trace elements you, the, you need to continually kind of assess what the environment is kicking out. And so, um, like, and, and that, the reason is because you can have very strong upwellings in some years that you have a pronounced barium signal that lasts throughout your continental uh, slope and, and further inland, further <laughs> towards the inland. Um, uh, but then in years that, that uh, upwelling could be substantially lower and, but yet you have fish that were in the same area, you know, a year apart, um, but yet your barium signal is telling you that they were, one was not even close to an upwelling and one was. And so the, 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 what I kind of always suggest is, you know, what we need more of is that isoscape kind of information, um, a, a, you know, yearly, seasonally, whatever, whatever scale we can afford, but, start to build up that map of what we'd expect um, through isotopic isoscapes um, throughout a region. And then from there you can say, okay, you know, we can't ask questions at the at the continental shelf versus the Aleutian Islands or, or sorry, continental shelf Gulf of Alaska versus Aleutian Islands, but maybe we can ask at the continental shelf scale of um, and but before you can before we can uh, do any of that is is kind of getting that baseline information of how variable in space are these and through time are these chemical signatures, um, and and yeah, I, I think that's the there's always a bit of um, of trepidation, and I think it's a good trepidation to have because um, it's it's a lot to expect that the environment is going to be constant. And a lot of these chemical signatures rely on um, really unique patterns of circulation and stuff. So, yeah. I have one question. Uh, we dipped our toes briefly into uh, 
trace element analysis around a decade ago, and we ran into a situation where the degree of difference we were seeing among samples was uh, essentially inside the variability we were getting with repeat batches sent to the labs for analysis. Oh, wow. Is there any emerging technology or have, do you think things have changed enough in the last 10 years that uh, we, we should try again? Good question. Um, I mean, de detection levels have definitely improved. Um, you know, the UW recently got a new mass back in laser and um, it, it allows obviously the more ions to come in and be seen and detected and quantified. Um, the your point of your basically variability within and among within an individual and among locations um yeah that is we've faced that in in my dissertation work in the tropics we were facing that um the the only the one kind of aspect i would say that offers me a really uh, interesting and, and kind of hopeful is as um, right now sulfur is becoming more uh, prevalent lithium um, analyses are also another one that are kind of increasing in the literature and um, and so I think with these with nowadays um, there's a lot a lar larger suite of elements that can be analyzed um, again whether or not within any of those is the solution to your spatial questions? I don't know. Um, uh, but I guess that would be where the hope would, would come is, is that kind of increase in the, the detectability of different elements. Um, sulfur, for example, there's a difference in kind of stagnant waters versus high flowing waters. You start to see a, it's been useful in mangroves versus kind of coral reefs and, and open areas. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of development in the basically the periodic table, figuring out which of these can vary through space and time at the scale you're interested in. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious, kind of piggy piggybacking off of that. Um, I've done some work on this stuff down in Southern California, looking at eelgrass beds and stuff. And so seems like a lot of the work is done mostly near shore, maybe um, estuarian, freshwater environments. And I'm kind of curious your input on, since we're the Pacific Halibut Commission, kind of looking at ground fish that's more deep water and what kind of impact that would have on looking at this type of analysis within otoliths and those types of things and kind of stuff that you had just described, um, kind of, how many studies have, have have there been a lot of studies looking at bottom fish ground fish that are in deep water compared to near shore environments yeah, yeah i mean you're right the near shore environments are are over representative um and i like i think as as you know kind of highlighted in the the salmon work is the estuarine and the freshwater areas have a really most of them a lot of them have a really unique chemical signal and when you get out in the ocean things get really stable um, at, at one kind of end of the spectrum and then highly variable in another and in, in an unpredictable way um, in terms of chemically speaking um, what I see in terms of understanding halibut movement what I think is kind of the most interesting potential would be um, the there's a couple of things one of which is um trace element analysis um so what i described in terms of these carbon and nitrogen stable isotope stuff people are are now working on uh, extracting carbon um, and nitrogen formation from otoliths so they're basically looking at the protein layer your otolith is alternating bands of calcium carbonate and uh, and protein and so they're focusing on the protein portion of that combination in extracting um, information about the food web that they've been feeding and the linkage trophic linkages um, so I think that has a, a lot of potential because um, in the work that I'm doing right now it, on stable isotopes, the turnover rate that we're focusing on muscle, and so it's like one to three month with a window. But if you've got an otolith from a halibut, 
and you can retrospectively look at the last five years. I don't know how these how old these guys get, but I know they get old. Then that's really powerful to to start to piece together food web information and how it's changed. If you've got archived odalists that go back 20 years or 50 years, then you can really start to build up food web um, shifts. Um, and so that I think is really cool. There's another approach. Sorry, I'm getting excited. Um, there's another approach that mag magnesium, I mentioned it's a metabolic activity. And so again, there have been a couple papers that have looked at estimating, um, estimating a oxygen consumption in a way from the um, magnesium information on, on the otolith. So basically kind of reconstructing um, metabolism. Um, and so that one's in its early stages, but there've been a couple of papers, one uh, I believe uh, from China um, that really kind of, in terms of like a bio, bioenergetics analysis to try to piece together how things have sh are, are again shifting um, in, in the ecosystem. The last one just came to me is oxygen isotope. Um, so you mentioned your halibut are always on the bottom, um, apart from the larval stage. And the oxygen isotope is, people are starting to look at that as a recorder of temperature. And so if there's some way that you could reconstruct depth via temperature um, relationships, I don't know how possible that is given upwelling could really throw that into the, the wrench into that, but uh, just speaking from the hip here, um, the I know that um, again using the otolith, you could re reconstruct portions of the life. I know that for oxygen isotope, it requires a lot of material to get enough in the kind of detection levels, and so you know you might not be able to reconstruct the last. 52 weeks, um, you know, it might be you're pooling several years worth of information to get a estimate. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know what this, this kind of temporal scale that you can look at, but that would be another tool. Um, and I think that like the killer whale study that I mentioned, well, this is the last point I'll mention, the, the integration of stable isotopes and the contaminants. Um, the fact that you have this gradient of pesticides in the Alaskan region could be a tool that you could capitalize on for looking at movement of, of halibut, basically replicating that kind of a study. Um, yeah, I don't know how excited people will be if you're starting to analyze contaminants in tissues, um, but, um, but if it gets at your question of movement, then whatever, yeah. I have a question about storage. So we have an incredible, we have almost 100 years of otolith, but we only have 10 years that are stored for clean collection. They're stored dry. The rest of our otoliths are stored in glycerin, glycerin thymol solution. Okay. So how much is that going to limit us on looking at chemical signatures? Good question. Um, I know that I would suspect it's going to hamper a lot. Um, how and, and the reason I say that is um, Stuart Ludson is at OSU. He was a postdoc back in the day when I was in the lab with him. Um, he published a paper on storage effects of otoliths. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was limited to like dry kept versus ethanol, um, okay. ethanol storage. But they saw differences in, and they were looking at like strontium and barium. Um, but they saw differences, if, I mem if memory serves, in, in a storage effect. Oh. Um, glycerin, um, I don't know. Um, again, just giving that ethanol effect, it, I would maybe that um, uh, there would be an effect on glycerin. However, I mean, I would take, I would start a study looking at the effect, you know, take one otolith, throw it in glycerin, like starting now, if you guys haven't already done so, and look at storage effects on otolith chemistry, put one of the le left otolith in in glycerin and the right otolith and or break half of one otolith, break them apart and split them up into different uh, storage containers and, and run an analysis to look if there's any sort of, in the suite of elements you're interested in, look to see if there's any sort of effects. Thank you. Sorry, I don't have a more solid answer on that one. All right, well, unless you're on the webinar, I would invite you guys to come bring more questions to lunch with us. <laughs> and let's thank Paul again for talking with us. Yeah.
Thanks for having me.